Thank you, Jenna. How much is beautiful. Well, welcome. Welcome to the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. Thank you all for coming out today, braving the uh, smoke and the uh, air and, and coming out on this beautiful day. Thanks for being here. And welcome to those of you watching on YouTube. Uh, glad that you're joining us as well. Seems that our uh, YouTube following is growing each uh, month, and that's a good thing to see, too. This powerful message can get out to more and more people. We're looking at, we're getting closer to live streaming, so the day may come when you can sit in your, uh, as Shirley May says, the bedside Baptist, and uh, enjoy our service as well. So uh, welcome to those of you on YouTube as well. If you're ever in this area, I invite you to come and be a part of one of our services. Uh, we promise you that we will do our best to make you feel right at home. Sometimes I like to start with a story, and today's story uh, comes from Guidepost Magazine this month. A lady by the name of uh, Danita Jones in Madison, Alabama, told about a time a few years ago in her life when, you know, things were, were going pretty good. Uh, she was living with her husband in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he had a good job. Uh, she was doing well. Uh, she had started a new production company. and. Um, video uh, type stuff and things were progressing things were looking good for her new startup company they had two little kids ages five and one and then she got a kind of a break and it was an opportunity to uh, do a video almost any place she wanted to and she thought well we got the chance I could go back to my home in Alabama and and do it there and so she convinced her husband to, to join her and they uh, went back to uh, Alabama for uh, this this shoot and thought it'd be a chance for the grandparents to kind of get to know the kids a little better and you know we all understand that and um, even though she was 30 some weeks pregnant they took off for Alabama and they went. And then the shoot went as planned. Um, everything went good. And after it was done, they were getting ready to go home when her water broke. And um, the babies came. Babies. <laughs> Plural. She had twins. Uh, and so they were really teeny and tiny, and they got to go straight to the uh, intensive care ward for babies, uh, their first two weeks of life. And so this really upset all of their plans, and her husband had to get back to Columbus uh, for his job, and their five-year-old had to get back, uh, you know, to go to school. And uh, so she stayed with the one-year-old and the babies. And during that period of time, uh, her mom was such a huge help to her with the new babies and, and the rest of her family. It was just really a great experience. Um, and things worked out so well that, th that her, the, her production company and the opportunity that she had down there looked like it was really going to come into something. And so she and her husband talked about it and they made the decision to, to go ahead and move to Alabama. So uh, he left his, his job fully knowing that he could get a good job down there and they moved to Alabama. And then just about everything went wrong. Uh, First of all, he could get a job okay in his field, and that was great, but the pay was significantly less than what he had enjoyed in Ohio. But he went ahead and took the job on the faith that the production company was going to do well, and then the production company's big opportunity dried up and went away. So they had no money for a house. They ended up, all six of them, having to move in with her mom and dad. And, and that was okay for a while. It, it was going along uh, all right. Um, and then her mom passed away. Suddenly died of a, of a heart attack. And um, uh, Danita sat in 
her mom's chair and was, why me? You know, I, I've done the things that I'm supposed to do in the world. I've been a good daughter, a good wife, uh, you know, a good mother. Why me? And um, then she thought back to a time when she had been in high school and she had tried out for a play in high school and, and she knew that she was perfect for the part and she tried out and she was confident that she got it. She knew she did well and they selected someone else. And she came home and she was mad. This isn't right. It's, I was the best one for that part. They, they should have picked me. It should have been my part. And her mom looked at her and said, didn't he, didn't he, it, it, it's just a dot. What do you mean it's just a dot? What does that mean anyway? And her mom was just an incredible teacher, a third grade teacher, and she reached into her drawer and she pulled out a page with a bunch of dots on it and numbers, and she said, what's this? Well, it's dot to dot. Yeah, no, no, I know it's dot to dot, but what's the picture? Well, I don't know what the picture is. You have to draw the lines and follow it to see what the picture is. And her mom said, you see, this is just a dot in your life. What are we, we're just dots? No, 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 we're not dots, we're the pencil. It is only God that knows what the picture looks like. It is God that puts the dots together. And she sat there in, the, in her mom's chair some two years later, looking down, and she looked and she saw her father playing with the twins. And he'd throw one off and the other one would crawl up on his back from behind and, and tossing the, the, the twins around and laughing and joking. And she, she thought about that lesson of the dots. She thought about how if she had not gone down to take that opportunity for her business, she wouldn't have been there to be surrounded by family and friends when she had two premature babies. She thought about how if she had not been there living in that house, she wouldn't have had the time to spend those last couple of years with her mother before she made her transition. She thought about how if she hadn't been there through all that, she wouldn't have been there to help her father through the grief and the struggles that he would have encountered with all of the things putting together a, a funeral and, and in the midst of the grief and all of the other stuff that she ended up having responsibility in for and doing. And in that moment she was able to draw together and maybe she didn't have the whole picture but she sure was able to connect some of the dots and realize that there is a greater picture, that there is something greater going on. And so she moved from that place of why me, which was our, our topic last week, and into a new topic, and that is a new attitude. And that's the topic of my talk today is a new attitude. I have three major points. One, God is for us. Number two, we all have difficulties. And number three, a new attitude. So God is for us. I, I thought about that and it really makes no sense to me that this divine creator, the, the infinite force, whatever you want to call this infinite intelligence, that it would create us to torture us or to make us miserable, that it would express itself through and as us in order to experience lack and limitation and poor health? It just doesn't make sense. The universe has experienced all of the misery and pain that it needs to. It only makes sense that that divine current is here for our benefit. And as I talked about last week, when we open ourselves up to that, sometimes that divine benefit the, the, the infinite spirit cares more about our growth than it does our comfort. And so sometimes we experience that which is painful. But if we can back up, we can see the dots and we can see how those dots go. We may not know it then, but we can have faith that those dots are revealing something greater. Um, I'm going to tell a story of Elisha from the Hebrew scriptures. And... Um, Biblical literature is 
powerful in so many ways. And I know that some people don't like the Bible and the things that are attached to it and whatnot, but I submit that the the Hebrew scriptures and the, and the Christian gospels were never created to be read literally. They were created for us to think, to use that thing between our ears and see how it feels. What does that mean to us? What is in our heart when we read that? And so I'm going to tell this story of Elisha, uh, abbreviated version because it's really long. Uh, <laughs> And you can see what you feel for it. And I can share with you what it says to me, but I can't say what it says to you. But Elisha, condensed version, um, he had he, a lot of people were not happy with him and they were kind of out to get him. Uh, he and his servant were uh, in a city um, and he had an idea that the... Uh, there were some people uh, after him. Uh, the servant woke up one day, uh, got out of it, you know, th th walked out of the house and looked around and oh boy, they had trouble there. They were surrounded by the enemy, surrounded by armies. I mean, this is an army. They had horses, they had chariots, they had big swords and all the way around them. And it was all around their house. Things are not looking good. So he went back and he says, boss, we got trouble. There's an army out there. <laughs> And he says, fear not, because we have more on our side than they have on theirs. Wait a minute, boss, he says, as far as I can see, it's just you and me. And there's a whole bunch of them, thousands of them. And so at that moment, Elisha prayed to God and he says, open my servant's eyes. And so the servant went out and he looked and he saw they were surrounded, but on the hillsides around that were tens of thousands of angels, uh, chariots of fire with golden swords that had the other army surrounded. And said, whoa, boss, what, do we, what, what happens next? So boss went out, Elijah went out, and he convinced this other army they had the wrong guy. No, 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 you come to the wrong city, you got the wrong guy, but I'll lead you to, to the right place. And we can go from the rest of the story from there. But the point of it is, is that Elisha had the faith to know that there was something greater on his side. That there was something more in the universe. And it wasn't against him, it was for him. So God is for us. Point number two, we all have difficulties. And another... Uh, story from Hebrew scriptures once again it's it's uh, not to be taken literal in my opinion uh, this is the story of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and I know that I've used this story before um, because I remember um, one uh, Saturday night I was getting ready for for Sunday and I had been in my office practicing and I walked down the, uh, the hallway and I could hear the grandkids playing in, in one of the rooms and they were rustling around in there. And I paused to listen to what they were saying. One of the old guys says, uh, what's he talking about? <laughs> Another one says, I don't know, I think it's camping. <laughs> the other one says, camping? Why is he talking about camping? I don't know. But he says, I heard him talking about his buddy Shadrach and uh, Meshach in their Winnebago. <laughs> they, they didn't even listen to the fiery furnace part. and that, They sort of missed that. But It's not Shadrach, Meshach, and their Winnebago. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were uh, Chaldean or Persian names that these uh, young uh, Hebrew uh, men had been forced to take. Uh, they were given a position in the government uh, by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king at that time. Uh, and uh, the king went on to require that uh, all of the uh, government employees had to give him an oath of fealty, an, an oath of allegiance to the king. And the way that they were to give this oath of fealty is they had to go out and uh, bow before this uh, golden image that he'd had uh, put up out in the plains. And so they had to go out and do that. And these three guys says, no, they're not going to do that. It's in their belief system that they couldn't put, you know, they couldn't 
bow before anything other than God. And so they said they're not going to do it. Well, that really, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't happy with that at all. You had to give your fealty to him. So um, he says, collect them up. We're going to bring them in. We're going to throw them in a furnace. That's a penalty again. Hey, well, I'm going to give you guys one last chance. And then into the furnace you go. And we're cranking the dial up on that baby. It's going to be seven times hotter. And they said, hey, sorry, but we're, we're good with it. And so he got his troops to throw him into the furnace, the seven times hotter furnace. And he left him in there long enough. He figured they were probably done cooked by now. So he opened the door to look. Sounds kind of like the cremation of Sam McGee, doesn't it? <laughs> and so he opened the look and looked in there. Instead of three guys, there's four. And, but they haven't burned up. They're still in there alive. It looked like they were in there chatting. And he couldn't believe it. So he says, this is impossible. So he says, all right, you guys can come on out. So three guys came back out and he asked them, how, how is this even possible? And they said, it's because our God protected us. Our God protected us. And we can look at that story literally. And I, I don't believe you could go into it big furnace that hot for that amount of time and come out alive without a burn or anything. But I do think that the, the meaning behind this is consistent and goes through the ages. And that meaning is that regardless of what goes in our lives, the effects, all of the things that go on in our life, we are constantly surrounded by that infinite intelligence that is with us at this and in every moment. Now we all have difficulties. We all end up in the furnace at one time or another. And it can come in a host of different ways. But as long as we are aware that there is a divine presence with us, that there is a fourth man inside that furnace, and that man could be woman, that that fourth being inside the furnace is with us and not against us, that gives us the courage to go on. Uh, colleague of mine told a story of uh, a 92 year old man um, who lost his uh, wife of uh, 70 years uh, she she passed away and and he um, could only see shapes a little bit he was legally blind and he was in a walker and he couldn't you know, exist on his own anymore and, and he had to go into uh, a senior assisted living type of a facility and so uh, he was being moved in there and he sat in the lobby for some time not knowing what was going to happen next and was kind of filled with fear and, and then this nurse came out and she was bubbly and happy and she says, come on, let me show you to your room and so he got in his walker and he started to follow her. And as they went down the hall, she started telling him, oh, you're going to love this room. You know, it's, it's really going to be great. You've got a great window in here. And the room has this great, wonderful layout. You're, you're really going to like it. And as he moved down the hall, he says, I love it. I love it. And she says, but sir, we're not even here yet. And he says, I know that. He says, it's not about the arrangement of, of the room. It's not about the arrangement of the furniture in the room. It's about the arrangement in my mind. And I've made up my mind that I love it. <laughs> and that's what this is really all about. It's in how we form a new attitude. As some of you know, uh, Jenna is going to be leaving us. Um, <laughs> we have a month. We have a month. We have a month. Um, now we can sit here and woe is me and cry and gnashing of teeth and <laughs> all of that, but we can also make the decision that we can love Jenna. We can appreciate all that she's done for us and we can be eternally grateful and we can look forward to something different. We can look forward to a, a new and different way of being. We can get a new attitude. We don't have to go into it being sour the rest of our time. And we do thank you. I mean...
today was one of those days where it takes me a minute to collect myself before I can get up. Surrender. It's beautiful. So my third point, a new attitude. Um, how do we change? How do we make that shift to a new attitude? I mean, that's not easy. When you've got stuff in your life, when you're in the furnace, it's kind of hard to realize that there's something better. It's really hard to realize that there's a different way to go. How do you make that shift? So yesterday at, at Pride, uh, I had one of the early shifts and I was uh, down at our booth um, and Jean was in there and, and we, we talked about it and I said, how do you reframe this? You know, from freak accident of her dog clipping her and knocking her down and just shattering her leg. How do you, ref you know, how do you reframe your attitude? And she thought for a minute and she said, well, I can feel the love. She said, I know that everybody at the center is praying for me, Carly. I know that you know, my husband, Brian, has been such an integral part and the universe is working together. So it's no coincidence that the day that Brian leaves, the very next day, her friend Susan came from the lower 48 to be there to help her. That the, all of the you know, universe is conspiring to help her in every way, but the thing that she returned to over and over again was the love. Now in this teaching, and I don't know what's in Mara higher, I don't know how you define God, Spirit, the thing itself, whatever name we assign to it, but one of the common things that we do for that is God is love. And love is God. And so what we can draw from this is what the strength that gave Jenna in this is love and God is love. So it is the strength of God that is within that. It is the awareness that that power, that presence is with her at every moment. It is the fourth man in the furnace. It is the awareness that that infinite presence is for us and not against us. One final, whew, better hurry. Uh, <laughs> another Hebrew story, uh, and, and this one is, is uh, the story of Joseph. He's the one, you know, he was the favorite son. Dad gave him the coat of many colors, which was a bad translation. I think it means uh, a fancy coat with uh, long sleeves. Um, <laughs> but he, he gave him the coat of many colors, and... Um, his brothers were jealous. And so they attacked him, they stole his coat, uh, they beat him up, they threw him in a pit, uh, they sold him uh, into slavery, he ended up in Egypt. I mean, the guy went through a really bad time. And you know, it would be really, really easy to go, woe is me, we lost our music director, woe is me. <laughs> I've had this bad happen in my life. I've had that bad happen in my life. Woe is me. Why me, Lord? When instead, Joseph kept a positive attitude through it all. Um, I mean, he ended up in Egypt and uh, he ended up as a slave. He'd be sold to the head guard's wife and she makes a pass at him and he was scared so he didn't do anything so she got mad and reported to the guard that she raped him so now he's thrown in jail uh, I mean everything you can imagine is going bad but Joseph always kept that attitude and the story goes on and on but it goes back to having a new attitude conclusion um, I didn't get a chance to ask you, Herb, about this before, so um, we're going to wing it, bad pun. Um, Ann and I were on a float plane from King Salmon out to Brooks Camp, and I had the opportunity to sit like right behind the pilot, and I could look at all those instruments up there and everything. And well, there's this one instrument, and it was kind of in the middle of the cluster, and I didn't know what it was. It was like a circle, and then the top half was blue, and the bottom half was kind of brown, and it looked like what there in there were maybe like wings in there, and I wonder what that is. So uh, I used my one question of the pilot. I says, "What instrument is that?" And he says. It's an attitude indicator. 
artificial horizon. <laughs> Gotta have one of those. <laughs> And boy, I said, oh, there's a sermon right there. <laughs> we, we've got an attitude indicator, <laughs> an artificial horizon. But, and I don't know if, if this is exactly right or not, but, the, oh, he started talking about pitch and haw and yaw, and I don't know what the hell works. <laughs> oh, yeah, vacuums and, it, you know, right over my head. But I got the, the, the overall impression that this uh, attitude indicator would give you an, a, a, uh, an indication whether you were climbing or whether you were going down. If you're just going just a little bit, you don't feel that. You know, unless you're really in a dive or really in a climb, it doesn't. It can be really deceiving. And so this instrument lets you know where your nose is pointed, so to speak. And I think that we're all equipped with an attitude indicator. We all come with our own attitude indicator. If we have our nose slightly up, we will continually climb and we can climb to the, the highest of, of levels. But if we have our nose slightly down, we can just auger into the ground and we have the ability to change it. And when we do that, we have the ability to connect the dots and see the greater good. We can see the big picture. And so it is with our awareness of that power, that presence, whether you call it God, Spirit, infinite intelligence, we know that that power is indeed infinite. It is in, around, and through all of everything all the time. And so that power, that presence is within each and every one of us. And that power is consistently and constantly conspiring for our own good, even when we don't realize it. Even when we feel like we're in the furnace, we know that there is the fourth person in there with us. And so I speak my word now for those that are experiencing lack and limitation, we just simply know that we live in an abundant universe. And that divine presence is ready to pour out the stores of heaven when we are ready to receive. I speak my word for those who are experiencing health challenges. We know that beneath and behind the appearance of disease, there is a perfection. And we call forth that perfection and we accept perfection. Whether it be a broken leg, a pinched nerve, a growth. We know that there is a power that is conspiring for our good. And I speak my word for those who are experiencing relationship issues, whether they be marriage issues, whether they be family issues, whether they be work, it makes no difference because each and every one of us are an expression of that most high and we've defined that most high as being a being of love as being a an infinite source of love and so we can set aside anything that looks other than love and know that the truth is is that love is expressing through and as each and every one of us at every moment and so we just give thanks we give thanks for our awareness of the power and the presence of God in our lives now we just give thanks we let it go we let it be and so it is. So it is.